World champion Garry Kasparov once said, I used to attack because it was the only thing I knew. Now I attack because I know it works. But here's the thing. Attacking does not always work. And very often when it doesn't work, it can backfire quickly. And the game today that we are looking at from Bobby Fischer's 60 memorable games, this is game seven. This is a great illustration of this concept. The idea that you should not always bank on an attack. You should not put all of your eggs into the basket of an attack because if your opponent can successfully defend from the attack, then the concessions that you've previously made might be your downfall. So as I mentioned, this is a great example of this. So let's not waste any time. Let's go straight into this game. If you don't know what the series is, I'm basically going through every single game from this book. So make sure you subscribe so you don't miss out on um, basically these 60 really, really strong illustrative games. Now, the opening stage is not so important. This is a very theoretical line. Um, there was one deviation um, after a6, knight d2 was played, queen e8, and here castles is definitely the move that is common and theoretical. Instead, g4 was played, which is very aggressive, and you can already see the intentions of white. They are really clear. White is going for an attack. They don't really care about uh, the various concessions that they're making in regards to their king safety and some of the, uh, you know, ruining the light square control that they have. They're going straight for the attack. And this could be a valid strategy, but you have to be very, very cautious when you employ it and how you do so. And as I am hinting upon, this time it does backfire. So knight c5, white castles long, which makes sense, and it is uh, very much in line with their ideas because they're trying to attack on the on the king side, so they're tucking away their king on the queen side. Bishop d7, we have f3, we have knight uh, to a4. After the trade, we have b3, the, the bishop comes back, and uh, already this move, bishop to f2, trying to continue to, to run down the board. Now, one of the questions you might have is, well, what did white do here that was so bad? I talked about how usually when you attack, you make certain concessions, and if the attack backfires, those concessions could be the reason that you end up losing. But what did white do that could really cause um, for for some for them to really lose this game? Well, one of the things is by really carelessly throwing these pawns at the opponent, they don't care for their pawn structure. And so in an endgame situation, if the pieces get traded, this king side uh, pawn structure, uh, could be a very big issue, and these pawns could be targets. But additionally, as you get later into the attack, that is when you really need to start making more serious concessions. And so if we look at this position, for the attack to keep going after the move b5, which is what was played, you need to somehow get more firepower. And so you look at this queen, okay, I need to get the queen in. And that really leads you to think about, okay, knight b1 and queen d2. And yes, these are the only means that you could try to keep forcing the attack, but well, now it's clear this knight is completely out of the game, and this is a major concession. And if the attack does not end up working, that could be a direct reason for black to gain some initiative, especially on the king side. This knight will have a hard time coming back and defending. And so as you get further and further into an attack, you usually have to make more serious um, concessions, and that is really when you want to evaluate, or is it worth it, right? How big uh, of a chance does the attack have to succeed? So knight to b1, let's flip all the way back. We're looking at this from Fisher's point of view, and white continues to open up the position. Queen d2, hitting h6, we have e4. Now opening up this bishop, uh, and then this position, the move rook dg1 was played, and I think this is another example of this. What is this rook doing? Nothing. White had some dream of bringing every piece into the attack, maybe sacrificing, pushing this forward, and maybe this rook comes into the game. But you're putting all of your eggs into this basket of the attack on the king side. Much stronger with the same idea was rook hg1, maintaining some uh, some structure and, and some possibilities in the center of the board. Still going for the attack, but doing so in a much more measured and, and careful way. Uh, but as I mentioned, this is what was played. We have takes, bishop h6. Now, one of the key moments of this video, I do like to give these uh, opportunities for you to pause the video and try uh, to find uh, the best option that Fisher played. So in this position, what do you play here to defend from bishop takes h6? So after bishop h6 is played, 
How do you defend? Now, the very nice defensive move in this position is rook to a7, and the idea is to swing over this rook that's doing nothing and help in the defense. The, the, this rook on the f-file is doing something. The queen has some clear ideas, so bringing this last piece a very nice strategical idea. I do want to mention something. If we back up for a second, white could have played rook takes g7 here and simplified into an endgame where they have a small... Uh, likely insignificant, but still a small advantage. And, and white is slightly better here. Um, but this is another example where their determination uh, of attacking is frankly what, what leads to their downfall. They should have gone for this and simplified, but they didn't want this. They wanted to continue attacking. They had their mind set on this attack so much so that they really were blinded from these opportunities to simplify into a small healthy advantage. And uh, this is exactly what happened in the game. Bishop h h6, but after rook a7, where is the attack continuing? They ended up trading now uh, with hopes of then going bishop d3 and still maintaining some initiative, but uh, unfortunately, it's already uh, a little too late. Now, another note here, why can they not take the pawn? This is another key moment. What is the move here? Pause the video and try to find it. The move is, of course, bishop takes b1, and after the king takes, we take now uh, on f3. We can also throw in, actually, uh, potentially this check first, maybe a little stronger. Um, if they don't take, I mean, they can give a check first, but then we can bring the bishop back. So bishop d3 is indeed much better. Um, but as I mentioned now, the simplifications are just not allowing for anything special. And in fact, in this final endgame, it is clear that now black is winning. So if we take a look at what happened in, in the last, really, 5 to 10 moves, white went from having some initiative, some attack, and then they decided to go a little bit too all out. They played this bishop h6 idea, and after rook a7, they realized they don't have anything, and they ended up really being forced to simplify into this endgame where it's clear that they're not better. In fact, in this endgame position, they're worse, possibly losing, because these pawns are connected and passed. And indeed, in just a couple of moves, black gets into the position. Knight h5, really gorgeous idea here, going for f4. Um, now, after knight takes e3, uh, you simply can go knight g3 and win the rook. And after king to f3, the only other move, but now e2 and white resign, because one of these pawns is promoting. If they move here, we can promote this one. If they take here, we also promote this one. It's game over. So hopefully you guys enjoyed the lesson uh, underlying this game and also the game itself. Make sure you guys subscribe so you don't miss out on more videos just like this. And I'll see you guys next time. Peace out.